As many of you know, hippos are an important part of Chimere's wetland ecosystem. For Hippo Day, you know I had to do a full episode. If any of you are new to this project, I encourage you to check out my first full video, What is Chimere? and my overview of the major clades of megafauna you can find in this Seed World project, which is also the setting of my literary work. Without further preamble, let's dive in! One of the most productive ecosystems in the known world is the freshwater wetland. High-protein vegetation is found in abundance. With such a bounty, it should be no surprise that a highly diverse cast of megafauna has gathered to claim their slice of the pie. During the Tyrant Dynasty, Ceratopsians were the undisputed kings of this niche. A variety of Parxosaurs, small sauropods, Ornithomimosaurs, non-Therian mammals, and crocodilians all competed for the fringes of the horned dinosaur's dominion. Herds of horned dinosaurs meandered through the marshes, often walking along the bottom using their scythe-like jaws to reap masses of vegetation. Although they had their kingdom, horned dinosaurs became reliant on the hadrosaur nesting colonies for their own hatcheries. You can learn more about the history and survival of this clade in last week's episode. When the Tyrant Dynasty concluded, and most of the hadrosaurs went extinct, horned dinosaurs were caught in the subsequent waves of ecological devastation. Most went extinct when the nesting sites they relied on to support their enormous herds disappeared. A few smaller species endured, forced to nest in wetlands to avoid competition with their giant and prolific cousins. Their fall left a glaring vacancy in the wetland ecology, and nature abhors a vacuum. These dinosaurian herbivores on the fringes were the first to step up to the plate, and small horned dinosaurs were among them. Adaptive radiations often follow mass extinctions, and lead to many strange and wondrous species. This arms race carried on in the wetlands of the eastern continent. In the known world, however, an unforeseen player entered the fold not from another region of Chimere, but harvested from Earth, and quickly found dominance. Large Therian Mammals. An influx of rhinoceros, desmostylians, and other large mammals had a simple advantage over the archosaurs vying for these early niches. Live birth. Not needing to defend nesting sites from competition in the form of other herbivores and the Megaraptor and predators meant that mammals were able to fully dedicate their time to eating a lot of food and getting massive. Horned dinosaurs, parxosaurs, and herbivorous crocodiles carried on, but in greatly reduced numbers. An arid period shook up the wetland cast, striking this ecosystem more so than others. This led to a minor extinction event that cleared out many wetland megafauna species. Once the environment settled around 6 million years ago, wetlands returned in greater force than ever before, today being the second most widespread terrestrial ecosystem in the known world after the conifer rainforests. It was in this setting which sloths came to Chimere. A plethora of wetland niches were available and they quickly stepped in. Together with the Parxosaurs, horned dinosaurs, rhinos, and desmostylians, sloths stabilized the tropical wetland ecologies with every species occupying a niche, be it in deep or shallow water and feeding on seagrass, hyacinths, or other forms of wetland vegetation. Water buffalo and some hippos were introduced a million and a half years ago and found widespread yet not disruptive success. The moose that came a little later preferred colder wetlands of Picardia that did not have a dramatic takeover. Two species of hippopotamus, Gorgops and Antiquus, were harvested, although being less social than modern hippos, both integrated without much worth saying. A few other semi-aquatic megafauna were introduced here and there, but the stability of the past six million years or so was maintained. Another cool and arid period, this one brief, triggered a fateful harvest from Africa some 250,000 years ago. Although many animals were introduced at this time, three species would dramatically alter the ecologies of the known world. First was Homo sapiens, 
who in modern Chimere have diverse civilizations throughout the known world. Second was the leopard, now the most common large cat by a factor of ten, thriving in a setting where being a compact, adaptable predator able to cache prey in trees was critical. Most relevant to the wetlands, however, was Hippopotamus amphibius, or the common hippo. With rapid reproduction, strong social instincts, extreme aggression, and an adaptable diet, a hippopotamus explosion was inevitable. The competition had gotten complacent during this golden age. Most were slow breeding and niche partitioned specialized to varying depths and types of vegetation. The adaptable hippo was a fast breeding generalist in all respects, putting numeric competition above all else in every tropical and subtropical wetland herbivore niche. In only a few thousand years, hippos went from being under a thousand harvested individuals to several million. The preluding arid period saw enough of a decrease in the water levels of the inland sea that hippos were able to island hop in their rapid expansion, reaching the western continent and even Picardia. This devastated the former stability. Dozens of species went extinct throughout the continents. The semi-aquatic rhinoceros, once common, were quickly driven to extinction. Freshwater desmostylians were also hit hard, with only one species remaining. South American ungulates, horned dinosaurs, and herbivorous crocodiles were all reduced or outcompeted altogether. Sloths held on, but their numbers and diversity was also reduced. Most hippopotamus in the known world are descended from the same large species found on Earth today. Like Earth hippos, they are negatively buoyant, courtesy of thick skin, being surprisingly poor swimmers, but sinking to effortlessly graze on vegetation at the bottom of wetlands. Their thick skin serves them well in defense against predators, although they are still vulnerable to predation by Megaraptorans, often being favored prey of Bakar and some Kurujaku. Hippos are classified as four subspecies by naturalists of the assembly, although some argue for species designation. Most widespread is the common hippopotamus. This animal has a greater tolerance of salt water than many others of its kind. While still a freshwater animal, this acceptance of a more saline condition has seen it spread to many islands, where multiple populations have become small. Their preferred diet is a range of terrestrial and aquatic grasses, although they are notoriously flexible. Their size is comparable to modern hippos of Earth, if a bit smaller, with males rarely weighing more than two tons. They are highly prolific animals, being found in most of the warm rivers and wetlands of the known world, and all other subspecies in the known world have some common hippo in their gene pools. The western hippopotamus is descended from common hippos that settled on Arvel early on. They are large animals, being bigger than their common kin, although reputed to be the least aggressive subspecies. They tend to live in small groups as opposed to the vast herds of their common cousins. Some have an extra set of incisors, leading some naturalists to speculate that they may at least partially be descended from Hexaprotodon, although this may simply be a mutation. Little is known of their diet and lifestyle, as they are most common in the lowlands north of the Republic, where the Assembly and naturalists of Bolondokoi don't have trusted contacts as a base for safe study. By far the largest and most aggressive subspecies is the Seritic Hippopotamus, often designated as the Behemoth in literature of the assembly. With tall eyes and massive size, it is believed to have integrated the now extinct Hippopotamus Gorgops into their population, although it is unknown if their genetics are a majority of either, so classification is difficult. These animals are massive herbivores, with males regularly exceeding four tons, and a few individuals surpassing eight. The common hippos in their territory are smaller than on average, kept that way by competitive exclusion, and although there was interbreeding before, it is now quite rare. They also niche partition their diets in addition to size, with the common hippos of the seritic wetlands grazing in the water-grass meadows common in the habitat, 
while the behemoth prefers hyacinths and other high-protein vegetation. Compared to their common cousins, their lower legs are short, helping to reduce drag as they run along the substrate. Their eyes are set higher on eye stalks than hippos of Earth, helping their visibility as their lives are spent almost exclusively in the water. Most derived of the genus is the Sonjaku, or Picardiant Ridgeback Hippopotamus. During the European harvest in the late Calabrian, two species of hippopotamus were brought through. Hippopotamus gorgops, or the behemoth, is only found in the crescent. A second species, Hippopotamus antiquus, was fairly rare by the time of the arrival of the modern hippo, only found in Picardia. Due to a generally cold climate compared to the rest of the known world, thanks to the cold currents brought north from the polar sea, the wetlands of Picardia were unappealing to most hippos, despite having many prolific wetlands. To combat the cold, Hippopotamus antiquus developed a layer of blubber. Despite their corpulent builds, hippos as we know them have very little fat. Their build is mostly due to several inches of skin on a compact, muscular torso. Thick skin gives them negative buoyancy. If the Picardian hippo only had blubber, they would float. To counter this, they have slightly thicker skin and are also known to swallow pebbles, especially as they fatten up for winter. This all adds up to impressive defenses, with their combined skin and blubber being up to 7 inches thick on the flanks of large males. Like the behemoth, the arrival of the common hippopotamus resulted in significant hybridization from this once more prolific animal. There is much debate about this species' status, as the Picardian hippopotamus is now a mix of both species. The cold adaptations of the original animal are retained, while adding the sociality and faster growth of the common hippo, making for a formidable hybrid. They are most common in the lowlands, and many frequent the estuaries and vast mangroves of the eastern gulf of the continent. They are highly territorial and aggressive animals, being considered by the Picardian to be the most dangerous beast on their island home, despite the fact that leopards and lions kill more people in the lands of the Confederacy. Two other hippos can be found in the known world. Both are quite small. The first, the dwarf hippo, was once widespread across the northern and western continents, but is now most common in the dense angiosperm jungles of the crescent, due mostly to competition with the common hippo. Unlike the pygmy hippos of Earth, it is a small species of hexaprotodon, making it possibly related to the western hippo. They generally weigh around 200 pounds. Strangest of the Chimeran hippos is the Highland hippo. They predate the two arid periods, being a relic of the now extinct hippos that came from Africa during a harvest almost 10 million years ago. They, like the Picardian hippos of the lowlands, have fattened up to better handle the cold. They are also burrowers, digging tunnels with their second and third hooves to endure the cold months of Picardia. When the warm season comes, they emerge and enjoy the bounties of the Great Lakes, alongside moose, parksosaurs, and shield drakes, in a much more peaceful ecosystem than most wetlands in Chimere. Cultural opinions of hippos vary. The Picardians revere the hippopotamus spirit Sonjaku as the greatest of warriors. Many Karatoan fighters will choose Sonjaku as their patron spirit, evoking their territorial ferocity while wearing tusks and armoring themselves in baked hippopotamus leather. To the Sarid, they are a most dangerous beast, and slaying a behemoth is a tremendous honor said to be the mark of a champion or king. The Chakati consider the common hippopotamus to be a pest for the damage that they do to fields and killing citizens and livestock. They order regular cullings, although this only seems to trigger more prolific reproduction, and the end result is the same number of hippos despite tremendous effort. The peoples of Arvel beyond the Republic walls are said to see the hippopotamus as a spirit of protection, wisdom, and guidance.
The hippopotamus represents the great potential of mammals. In a short time, they have completely reshaped the ecology of Chimeran wetlands. They are by a wide margin the most common large mammal in the known world, thriving in this verdant and competitive landscape. Thank you all so much for joining! Given the importance of hippopotamuses in Chimere, you can't imagine how much I was looking forward to this. Gratitude to all for supporting me on this wild ride. Special thanks to my patrons Dr. Helarctos, Leandra, Harris, Chris, Inakai, Alexander, Kai, Sunny, Alex, and Gage. The more support I get on Patreon, the more time I can dedicate to Chimere, be it writing, putting together the wiki, videos, and the bestiary. At the moment, I don't have any Patreon-exclusive content. At this point, it just gives you access to higher resolution pictures than I can normally post. I appreciate all the support I've gotten along the way. Our next episode will be a pangolin special, followed by the rest of the insectivorous mammals and dinosaurs of the known world. Until next time, stay fantastic. Cheers, folks! <laughs>